This video is sponsored by TrueFire. Over 2 million guitar players worldwide improve their playing using TrueFire's online lesson systems. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World. We're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. If you grew up in the late 60s, longing for an electric guitar to emulate the bands that were starting to appear on TV, you doubtless spent many hours staring at the pages of the Sears Wish Book. Here, you'd have found instruments under the Silvertone name, or in the Montgomery Ward catalog under the Airline name. These amps and guitars were actually built in New Jersey by innovator Nathan Daniel. So if you've always wondered where these objects of your youthful fantasies came from, then stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World Short History of Dan Electro. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store and grab a t-shirt or a hoodie to support what we're doing here. And if you don't need another hoodie, but want to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, think about becoming a friend of 5 Watt. The links are in the description. Oh, and in response to requests, I've also added a chip jar. Dan Electro was named after owner and founder Nathan Daniel. Though this video is going to focus on the guitars, and in particular the most popular models, the Shorthorn or DC-59 model and the Coral Sitar, the story actually started in the 40s with the amplifiers. Daniel started his career building amplifiers at Epiphone, but went out on his own in 1946 and began marketing amps under his own Dan Electro brand. Always making a point of meeting the right people, by 1948 he was also the sole amp builder for Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Wards. It took me a few minutes to get my head around this bit of history. In 1948, Daniel was the exclusive supplier of amps to Sears. It wasn't a factory building amplifiers. No, this was Nate Daniel building the amps alone. Such was the small world of amplifier building in those earliest days. Daniel's deal with the department stores also allowed him to sell amps in music stores, and he offered a professional line of amps with different cosmetics under the Dan Electro title. The Sears amps were rebranded as Silvertone and at Montgomery Ward under the brand Airline. With the two store contracts in hand, Daniel took the plunge and built the first ever large-scale amplifier manufacturing plant near Red Bank, New Jersey. An electrical engineer by training, Daniel was a leader in early amplifier design. Despite their department store association, these early point-to-point -point amps have aged well and have become cult classics being used by Dan Auerbach from the Black Keys and by Jack White. To put this into context, Fender had launched their first solid body electric guitars in 1950, and the Gibson Les Paul had been launched in 1952. So by 1954, with demand growing for electric guitars, Sears asked their amp guy if he couldn't provide them with guitars under the same Silvertone moniker. So Daniel set out to design a guitar that was inexpensive to manufacture and had enough quality that would not discourage a new player, a difficult thing to do at an entry level price point. Daniel went his own way, wildly innovating in his designs to keep costs down. And for this reason, nothing looks like or sounds like a Dan Electro. Daniel found it easy to think outside the box when designing an electric guitar because, like Leo Fender, he was not a guitar player. In an interview from 1982, Daniel said, I just analyzed what an electric guitar needs to be from an engineering point of view, and then I built it. Daniel also turned to luthier friends like John D'Angelico for help in what made up a guitar design. Not accepting the common solutions, he tinkered to figure things out, always looking for ways to make the guitars both more robust and more affordable. For example, he didn't believe truss rods were, quote, a long-term solution, end quote. So he settled on using a tightly fit square tube of aluminum running inside the neck for reinforcement. He used aluminum string nuts because they were less expensive to mass produce, and he liked the additional sustain they provided. Many of these unique build features are no doubt the reasons that 50 years later, Danos are more collectible than ever, being used in studios by top players for their unique mojo. Generally, the guitars were about one quarter the price of Fender's and Gibson's on offer at the time. Like most major American guitar companies, Dan Electro's golden years were in the 50s and 60s, and in this case, from about 1954 to 1969. Once the company began building their inexpensive and great sounding guitars, the factory grew by leaps and bounds, running double time shifts in the summer, preparing for the Christmas rush at Sears. The first solid body guitars for Sears varied quite a bit from the later Silvertone models. The earliest models were made from poplar and were covered with a dark red or maroon vinyl, built with either one or two pickups, which were under the melamine pickguard. Even these first guitars had the signature Dan Electro stacked or concentric volume and tone knobs on the two pickup models. Uniquely, the two pickup guitars had their pickups wired in series rather than in parallel, so that when you select both pickups, there's an increase in volume and a boost in mid-range. 
These first guitars had slightly smaller bodies than the more familiar and later U-series guitars that were launched in 56 and 57. By 56, Daniel had moved to making the semi-hollow body design that typifies what most of us think of when we think of most famous Dan Electro models today. These first U-series guitars were the first to have that semi-solid construction. The pickup coil that had been below the pickguard got the now famous lipstick tube treatment starting in around 1956. Daniel also launched the first affordable and great sounding four and six string basses in 1956. The guitars had a front and back made of masonite, a composite material of pressed steamed wood fibers molded together. This material was cheaper than either solid wood or plywood. The front and back were then attached to a simple poplar wood frame. The seam along the side was hidden by a strip of adhesive vinyl tape. The aluminum reinforcement tube made them very stable, and to adjust the string height, you raised and lowered the bridge. He used a variety of unique headstock shapes, which often allowed the strings to run more directly to the tuners. Likely the most striking feature of the guitars is the lipstick tube pickups. The story that these originated because Daniel was able to buy a large quantity of actual lipstick tubes now seems to be apocryphal. Though widely accepted, not really too accurate. Jerry Jones from Nashville is considered an expert on vintage Dan Electros and told James Brill that Dan Electro likely had their lipstick casings made by Lakewood Metal Products in Waterbury, Connecticut, the same as Jerry Jones had used. This company also made lipstick tubes for Max Factor Cosmetics, so the actual truth might fall somewhere in between. Jerry Jones also commented on the magnets used, saying, There were at least three different magnet sizes, and all were brake bar Alnico 6. And closing the entire pickup in the brass tube also provided more shielding, helping keep the single coil pickups quieter than more traditional designs. An incredibly simple design, the copper windings were wrapped directly around the bar magnet without any bobbin, occasionally sealed in wax or lacquer. Most pickups have a bobbin surrounding the magnet or magnets where the wire is wound. The bar magnet creates a different sort of magnetic field than having individual pole pieces. This creates a different sort of field altogether, picking up the vibration of the string, which is translates to voltage, and finally, to sound at the amp. A P90 is another example of a bar magnet pickup. The original lipstick models are also longer than other traditional single coils. Lipstick pickups have more note smear and have a less precise sound because of the crossover of strings sharing the single long magnetic field. When distorted, the resulting distortion highlights the artifacts unique to the design even more. Many think they are in their sweet spot when slightly to fall on distorted. They tend to have scooped mids and a very bright top end and a loose bass response. And for this reason, they're often used for rhythm parts. It's also notable that the pickups were very low output. By way of comparison, a 50s style Stratocaster pickup would have had a DC resistance of about 6K, but a lipstick pickup might be only 3 to 4K. I've seen it written that they are, quote, much quieter, end quote, than regular single coil pickups, and this impression is likely due to both the lower output and to the additional shielding provided by being completely enclosed in the tube. By 1958, the manufacturing was moved from Red Bank, New Jersey, to a new plant in Neptune City, New Jersey, and hence the expression, Guitars from Neptune, was born. Nate Daniel would meet Vinnie Bell at the NAMM show that year, and that yielded an interesting results that we'll come back to later in our story. And so it is that in 1958, we come to the guitar model, without which I likely wouldn't be telling this story at all. When I asked some of my friends about doing a short history of Dan Electro, they generally responded, well, if it wasn't for Jimmy Page using one, and they might be right. That image of Page playing cashmere on his Nano live at Nebworth is one of the absolutely classic images of rock, right up there with Hendrix at Woodstock or Townsend at Leeds. In the recently released Jimmy Page, the anthology, Page notes, I bought the Dan Electro from Selmer while I was a studio musician. Guitars of all brands were becoming more and more expensive. Then the Dan Electro appeared. It was a two pickup guitar, a budget option at about 35 or 40 pounds. I got one really early. It was a major guitar in my history. I played Summer Black Mountain Side on it live, including at the Royal Bar Hall concert in 1970. I also wrote Cashmere and In My Time of Dying on it. During early Led Zeppelin concerts, before I got the Les Paul No. 1, if I broke a string on the Fender, then the Dan Electro would be the backup. That Nebworth performance is amazing, but equally worth seeking out is the live performance of White Summer that Jimmy mentions in the quote. Unlike the Cashmere video, which is a wash in strings and organ parts, the solo performance sections of White Summer really show off the unique tone of the Dan Electro. <laughs>
Watching both of these videos, it's interesting to note that in both, the guitar being played has the original style bridge with the rosewood bridge insert. I found this curious, so I turned, as I often do, to Dave Honorato of Dojo Guitar Repair in Atlanta, and he again dazzled me with his knowledge of guitar minutia. He told me that Greg Kerbo was Page's guitar tech for many, many years, and that Kerbo swapped out the bridge at Page's urging to a Leo Kwan badass bridge in 1975. So all the classic cuts that we think of as being played on that Dano would have been done with the original Rosewood style bridge. You might take that into account when deciding which reissue or vintage shorthorn to add to your page collection. The new style double cutaway shorthorn standard and deluxe were released in 58 and so it's safe to assume that they were built in the new factory at Neptune City. Initially issued with a kidney shaped pickguard, this was later changed to what is commonly referred to as the seal shaped swooping pickguard that has always screamed 1960s <laughs> to me. The standard came with a single pickup in black or bronze, and the two pickup model came in black, bronze, and blonde. This dual pickup standard, model 3021, is referred to simply often now as the page model, and it's notable that it is by far the most collectible style and color combination among vintage Danos due to page's use. The deluxe model with its two or three pickup versions came with the famous and sometimes reviled concentric control knobs. The deluxe models were also released with two pointer tone knobs. The shorthorn bass with a short 30 inch scale with a single pickup was released in both four and six string versions that same year. In 59 we saw the first double necks, six and four string bass with one pickup for each neck. The longhorn bass in four and six string with dual pickups and a concentric volume and tone knobs. And here is where the friendship that Daniel had struck up with New York session ace Vince Vinnie Bell comes to fruition. Together they launched a separate brand line named Coral, and it was under that name that they built the second most widely known Dan Electra instrument, the Bell Coral Sitar. Designed to emulate the sound of a sitar that was becoming popular in the psychedelic music of the 60s. Bell had actually built the first prototypes himself. So Daniel and Bell set out to mass produce an instrument that a guitarist could play that would emulate the sound of a sitar. It has a traditional six guitar strings, and above those are 13 strings that are tuned as a sympathetic chord for accompaniment. The bridge on the six string is a wide and flat piece of rosewood, creating the signature sitar buzzing tone. The instrument had three lipstick tube pickups with individual volume and tone controls for each pickup. It came in a unique finish, which they called textured Bombay Red. The variety of tunes using a coral sitar sort of boggles the mind. One of the earliest was on Donovan's Hurdy Gurdy Man, where Jimmy Page, appropriately enough, played the part. B.J. Thomas recorded Hooked on a Feeling in 1968, Harry Chapin's Cats in the Cradle, Steely Dan's Do It Again, Stevie Wonder's Signed, Sealed, Delivered, Tom Petty's Don't Come Around Here No More, Yes's Close to the Edge, even Metallica used one on Wherever I May Roam, and famously Pat Metheny plays the melody on his tune Last Train Home on a choral sitar. Bell designed other instruments with Daniel, including an electric bazooki and the guitar lin, a 31 fret guitar that can be used to simulate the sound of a mandolin. By the late 60s, at their peak of production, the Dan Electra factory would fill a boxcar with products to go to Sears every day. But by 68, Daniel was growing tired of the business, and he sold Dan Electra to MCA Universal for a reported $6 million. Nate Daniel remained at the company throughout the transition. But MCA changed their sales model, and Sears canceled the contract. Without the lucrative Sears contract, MCA closed the factory abruptly in the middle of 1969. And with this, the golden era of Dan Electro came to an end. Fast forward to 1997. Steve Rittinger at Avex Corp was looking around for an old brand name to resurrect and settled on Dan Electro. Rittinger had a background in effects design, having started at the tender age of 14 marketing an early fuzz pedal. Evex bought the trademark intending to make pedals, which they launched at NAMM in 97. All the dealers were excited, and the pedals did very well, but the dealers said, hey, where are the guitars? They listened, and by the next NAM show, they had the guitars ready. They were wildly popular. They sold over 100,000 guitars in 1998 alone. At an interview with Mitch Gallagher at Sweetwater, Rittinger says that the timing was perfect. The guitar had been off the market for 30 years, and it was in a period when everyone was embracing all things retro. Production of the reissue guitars has moved from Korea to China and recently back to Korea. You can currently get multiple versions of the classic U2 guitars, the Dolphin Headstock Baritones, and the Shorthorn DC guitars with both the original Rosewood bridge and the modified bridge like Page had later on. And you can get a recreation of either of the two electric sitar style guitars originally produced in the 60s. 
I've partnered with Truefire because I've used them for over a decade and my playing always improves when I put in the time on their lessons. Whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or professional level player, Truefire has lessons to inspire and advance your playing. As you know, I always promote spending money on lessons before new gear. I really like Truefire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Get 25% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 25 or like I have for many years, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. You can sample anything in the catalog with the All Access Pass and see where the muse takes you. I love their tagline, learn, practice, and play with Truefire. I'd like to thank Truefire for partnering with me and sponsoring this video. So they started with the guitars from the back catalog, but in 2014 they began looking for some new and unique things to build, and they began combining features from the old guitars into new models. Things like double lipstick tube humbucking pickups appeared, and Moserite style bodies were stirred up with Dano type features. All still very recognizable as Danos, but in combinations never built in the old days. Redinger said, we are often not the player's main guitar, and that's fine with us, because we fill some of these other niches very well. He added that the Black DC is by far the best seller, with the 12 string and the baritones being popular as well. And that brings us up to date. If I missed your favorite part of the Dan Electro story, please put it in the comments for everyone to enjoy. I know from experience that I can count on you. First, I need to thank the extraordinary RJ Ronquillo for agreeing to play his DC 59 MD for the video. I'm always struck by the tremendous range of RJ's playing. It really doesn't seem to be much he can't do with a guitar. If you're not watching his YouTube channel already, you should be. The link's in the description. This video would not have been possible without Guitars from Neptune, A Definitive Journey into Dan Electromania by Paul Bechtold and Doug Tulloch, and Jimmy Page, The Anthology by Jimmy Page, an amazing compilation of all the things that Jimmy has not sold during his long career. There are links to the books in the description. I need to thank James Brill for his articles on Reverb on both the Dan Electro history and their unique lipstick tube pickup configuration. I need to thank all of you that have stopped by the store to buy a t-shirt, hoodie, or the Stomp Reset Pack. In particular, I need to thank the friends of 5 Watt. It's an ever-growing group of guitar obsessives, and I appreciate you guys being along for the ride and supporting 5 Watt World. If you enjoyed this short history of Dan Electro, hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that too. Thanks for watching. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt World.